Hello everybody, welcome to the Ambassador's Lecture of uh, Rabat Reflex in cooperation with International Office. Um, I'm going to keep it short. Um, today we're going to listen to a lecture of Ambassador Sabine Nolke. Sabine Nolke is Ambassador of Canada to the Netherlands. Um, after her short presentations about Canada and about uh, refugee policy, she is going to uh, be interviewed by Professor Evert van der Zweden. He is Professor of Social and Political Philosophy at our university. Um, but first, there is a short opening, and for that I want to introduce uh, Sebastian Kochtman to the stage. He's going to give a short introduction to who Sabine Nolke is, and uh, wish you a warm welcome from Radboud University. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, for the Dutch, I'm Bas Kochtman, international I'm Sebastian Kortman, and I'm just for some minutes back in the arena of the rector, uh, in the role of the rector, because our uh, rector, Han van Krieken, is uh, uh, abroad. I would like to welcome all of you, of course, uh, to this ambassador's lecture organized by Radboud Reflex and the International Office. And I would like to extend a special warm welcome to Sabine Nulke, Ambassador of Canada to the Netherlands. And I won't talk about you, because people know you, and I'm convinced that those who don't know you have already Googled to be well informed before you start. But we are very pleased to have such an eminent guest here in Nijmegen. And earlier, earlier today, you visited our Radboud campus, and met many of our researchers and students. We are very honored that you are willing to deliver today's ambassador's lecture on the subject of Canada's response to the refugee crisis. This crisis is probably the most complicated and challenging global issue that confront confronts us today. It's also a topic of particular interest to our staff and students. In October 2015, this university welcomed approximately 3,000 new neighbors. They were refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, and Eritrea, and found temporary shelter in what was called Hermans Oort Asylum Center, located only one kilometer from this campus. Almost immediately after the mayor of Nijmegen announced that this asylum camp was going to be built, staff and students at this university made it clear they wanted to help in one way or another. A lot of activities were undertaken and quite frankly, most of them were really successful. For instance, through crowdfunding, 50,000 euro was collected for textbooks for refugees to learn Dutch. Many people, students as well as staff, taught the refugees basic Dutch. And we all know that one of the main conditions for successful integration into a country is to know the local language. We also launched a series of lectures aimed at refugees with an academic background. It was called Food for Thought and offered a mix of short lectures or presentations featuring distinguished speakers from many fields and from several faculties. The lectures touched on some aspects of Dutch society as well as several academic subjects from different perspectives, including European and international ones. These activities formed the basis for many new friendships. The university also supplied facilities for a kitchen where the meals for our 3,000 new neighbors were prepared daily. Last May, Hermans Earth closed and all its inhabitants were moved to other locations in the Netherlands. But it doesn't mean that we can rest on our laurels. In many places around the world, including Europe and the Netherlands, we are witnessing 
the growth of nationalist sentiments. Expressions of xenophobia and Islamophobia are the order of the day, while populist parties exploit the, dissati the dissatisfaction and fear that many citizens are experiencing. We need to convey that refugees are still welcome in the Netherlands. As a university and academic community, we must embrace these refugees and give them the chance to feel emancipated in Dutch society. In other, in other words, to feel part of our society. We will undoubtedly encounter obstacles in this, but one way to overcome these is to draw on inspiration from other countries. Therefore, Ms. Dulke, we are also all very eager to hear your story and to find out what we can learn from the Canadian approach to refugee issues. Thank you so much for your willingness to deliver today today's ambassador lecture. You have the floor. Um, thank you very much for this very kind introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak. I'm very, very happy actually to tell a little bit about uh, Canada's story, about, uh, about the refugee resettlement that we've done. But uh, what I would like to do with your indulgence, I'd like to put it into a bit of a context of Canada's overall um, approach to immigration, integration and diversity. Because I think those are the very key elements that, that fed into our decision, into our government's decision to deal with the Syrian refugee crisis in the way it has. It was a very Canadian approach. I've been, I've been very heartened to see recently in, in a number of um, news sites, BBC, for example, has done stories on, on Canada, various news um, papers have, New York Times, on our refugee resettlement program. And, uh, it was characterized, I think the BBC headline I liked the best was Canada, a different voice. Um, you very, um, Rector, you, you very uh, correctly, I think, alerted to the emergence of, uh, of nationalism and, uh, and s sometimes racism, I suppose, in response to the influx of migrants from, uh, from abroad into Europe. And um, it's not something that Canada is free of. I want to make that absolutely clear. We have those issues as well. Uh, but we also have a history that I think makes us look at these issues a little bit differently than some. Um, the example that I will give you, the example of Canada, is not an example that fits all. It's, it's our approach. But I think you may find in it elements that, uh, that you might be uh, interested in thinking about and that certainly Dutch policymakers are increasingly becoming interested in as well. Um, so, so let me uh, start, I think, with um, a bit of an outline of the presentation that I'll be given, giving. I'll give you a bit of background of facts and figures. I, I shan't bore you with too many of those because uh, they're not all that interesting. Um, a bit of our history of diversity and the founding of our approach to multiculturalism. And then I'll, I'll go into the, into the resettlement of, Canadian, uh, of uh, Syrian refugees in Canada. Um, the context, of course, uh, today is um, based very much on our geography and on our history. Um, I'm not going to go over the, the things that you see on the slide. You can, you can read those. But um, I think what, what you will want to look at is Canada on that map looks pretty small. It isn't. I remember when I grew up as a, as a kid in Germany looking at a map of Canada and the United States, and it was one page in our school atlas. And so was Germany, was one page. So I figured, well, they had to be the same size. Well, that's not how it works. Um, Canada holds Europe about, I think, four times, four or five times. And that's Europe all the way to the Urals. So it's, um, well, OK, maybe twice. But um, I thought, I thought we were, bigger. we were the second biggest country in the world. And, and I remember, well, I don't have to remember. It happens all the time. People say to me, well, Canada is so big. Why don't you take more people? Well, it's a big country, but something like 80% of our population is actually 
urban, focused on the small number of cities, and the majority of our population is in a very small corridor between uh, Quebec City and Windsor, along the bottom. You see that little oval there at the bottom? That's where the majority of Canadians live. And, and everything you see beyond up there is um, pretty much empty. Nunavut is our largest territory and our most recent, uh, pro uh, not province, we call it a territory. It's, uh, it's Inuit, it's uh, Aboriginal, self-governed, and it has, it's about the size of half of Europe, and it has 20,000 people in it. So, and that's not because we don't have enough people to put there, it's because that's all the population it will sustain. Nothing grows there. So, um, so yes, Canada is large, but we have our own challenges coming from geography. Geography also gives us an advantage, and um, that is something I hear about a lot as well, is we are pretty far away from everywhere else. The boats don't reach us. People cannot just walk to Canada. Syrian refugees could theoretically, if they really wanted to, walk to the Netherlands. That doesn't happen with Canada. So either there has to be a major effort involved in, in terms of uh, air transport or ship transport, which is difficult to get across the Atlantic or the Pacific, or they have to be brought in. So that's, a, that's another difference that, that we have um, in terms of our geography. Um, Canada, of course, is a wealthy country. We're a member of the G7. We have a very sound economy. We emerged out of the 2008 crisis with relatively flying colors compared to some others. And, uh, and so the, this, this is the various, uh, this is the background, I think, to, um, to who we are as a country. The um, history of Canada is something else. We call it founded in diversity. You, uh, you will know that um, Canada is a bilingual country. We have two official languages, English and French. Je peux parler français avec vous si vous le désirez. As a Canadian public servant, I have to be speaking, have to be able to speak both. It's part of our DNA. Um, the founding nations, Britain and France, is um, the history wasn't always rosy. The uh, the reason we are members of the Commonwealth, we are also members of the Francophonie, but we are members of the Commonwealth and have the Queen of our as our head of state still, is as founded in history. There's a battle in the 18th century on the plains of Abraham, which, uh, in which the, Brit, the British uh, emerged as the winners. And that has also colored our history to some extent. Uh, it has not always been easy for our two um, linguistic groups to come together, but, but we've worked on it. And of course, we have an Aboriginal population. The uh, Aboriginal peoples, as we call them, and the S is important, Aboriginal peoples, is a collective name for the original peoples of North America. And um, prior to uh, the arrival of the French and British, they had been in Canada for about a thousand years, coming over the Bering Strait, mostly from, uh, from Central Asia. Um, the Canadian Constitution recognizes three groups of Aboriginal peoples. Um, Indians, as Europeans would call them, we don't ever call them that, the Indians, commonly referred to as the First Nations. Uh, Métis, uh, which is a combination of Aboriginals and, uh, and white settlers, and the Inuit, used to be called the Eskimos, don't ever call them Eskimos, they're Inuit. Um, three distinct peoples with their own unique histories, languages, cultural practices, or spiritual beliefs. Uh, about 1.4 million Canadians identify themselves as Aboriginal persons, which is about 4% of our population. Uh, 617 First Nation communities, which represent more than 50 cultural groups and 50 plus Aboriginal languages, some of whom are, some of which are unfortunately already on their way to extinction, not spoken very much anymore. The, um, so you have, you're starting out with three population groups that you have to integrate a little bit. Um, for, uh, for the longest time, government policy focused on the British and the English element. Uh, again, uh, for about 100 years after Confederation, which took place in 1867, we'll be celebrating 150 years of Canada next year. Um, for about the first hundred years or so, English did dominate, and there's absolutely no doubt about that. And there was considerable linguistic, cultural, um, 
not suppression but discrimination mm -hmm. against the French-speaking population. And uh, that ended in the 1950s and 1960s when our province of Quebec, which is primarily French-speaking, uh, essentially started to assert its language rights and, and wanted to have a stronger voice within, within Canada. The uh, federal government's response to that was the uh, Bilingual and Biculturalism Commission, which was uh, created in, let me look at the year, I think it was, I, I don't have that, in the 1960s, anyway, 1969, sorry. Uh, 1969, we then, based on the recommendations of the commission, enacted the first Official Languages Act, which made absolutely sure that in all proceedings of the government of Canada, French and English were given equal status. And uh, so recognition that as a country we had to come together and we had to make policies that essentially um, forced the two separate populations to live side by side and live together as equals. This is also reflected in the Canadian Constitution, which uh, was written in eight, uh, 1982, relatively recent, under the previous Prime Minister Trudeau, Pierre, Tr Pierre Elliott Trudeau, repatriated the Constitution and added uh, in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Canadian Charter incorporates in, in places almost verbatim the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights with all its protections on disc against discrimination on the basis of ethnicity, race, nationality, origin, sexuality, uh, sex, um, religion, etc. Um, it has since also been interpreted, and I think that's an important point, as incorporating by reference, if not explicitly, explicitly sexual orientation. So uh, we have all the protections um, in the Canadian Charter. The, um, the Official Languages Act was subsequently, with the, interpret with the arrival of the uh, Charter, uh, mo modified to include implementations of the language rights guaranteed by the Charter. And it now extends to two new areas, language of work and the equitable participation of francophones and anglophones within the public service. And uh, that's something that sometimes is still a little bit tricky to administer and implement in reality. But, uh, but we're, we're working on it very hard. About three quarters of Canadians speak primarily English and about a quarter speak primarily French. And here's a trick question for you. What do you think might be the third most common language spoken in Canada? Chinese. Chinese. And that combines Cantonese and Mandarin, if you look at them together. If you, if you split them up, it's Punjabi, which is, uh, again, gives you an idea of the ethnic makeup of Canada through immigration. Um, I, I won't go through very much uh, the bilingual aspect anymore, but uh, multiculturalism became a government policy in 1971, again under the previous Prime Minister Trudeau, our current Prime Minister Trudeau's father. Um, it's uh, basically the way we look now as a society is we have 87% of Canadians, um, sorry, um, no, let, let me have a look at my notes here, I apologize. Where are my facts and figures? Yes, we have over 200 ethnic origins represented in Canada, 200. That's, that's quite a large number, and Aboriginals, as I mentioned, are 4% of that. We had in 2011, at the latest census, 13 different ethnic origins surpassed the 1 million mark. So ethnic groups of over 1 million, we have 13 of them. 19.1% uh, of our population are what we would call visible minorities. And um, we have a foreign-born population of approximately 6.8 million. That's roughly 20% of Canadians who are not born in Canada, and I'm one of them. And I think that's, that's something that might be useful to mention at this point. You may have already heard it by my accent. I was not born in Canada. I was born and raised in Germany and uh, came to Canada as an exchange student, met my husband and never left. So any, any one of those of you who might be considering doing at some point a year in Canada, well, you never know what might happen. 
but uh, but I, I get the question a lot when I present my business cards to people and say, your name is Nölke, that doesn't sound Canadian. Um, well, to me, it, my response is usually, well, it's as Canadian as Wong or Wilczynski or Thompson or Nguyen or, or Singh. It's, we're, we're all the same. So yes, it is a Canadian name. But, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think it speaks quite well, I think, of um, the approach that Canada has taken to integration of immigrants, that someone like me, who was not born there, can end up as the ambassador of the country to, to the Netherlands. I, I, I think this is integration in action, and, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a sign that uh, I think we're getting something right. Of course, I would say that because I'm benefiting from it. But... Um, but it's a, it's a good indication of who we are. My closest friend in the department is our ambassador in Norway, and he is a Polish refugee. He's also gay and he's also Jewish. And uh, it's, you know, that's, that's who we are. That's who we send out as our ambassadors, and I, I, I love it. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Now, um, with regard to the ethnic minorities, about 3% of Canadians are Dutch. But the Dutch have integrated so well that linguistically they don't show up on the map. And I think the fact that I'm giving this lecture in English and you all understand it, I think is an indication why you all speak fantastic English. You come to Canada, you integrate, and the Dutch disappears within the generation. That is unfortunate but uh, in some respects, but, uh, but it is a fact. So we do have, however, about um, 1.5 million Dutch Canadians. Um, they come from a diverse background as farmers seeking land, war brides, a lot of war brides after the Second World War, or just simply seeking opportunities. Um, Friesland was a primary source of immigrants, again, after the war the situation was difficult there. A lot of uh, Friesians emigrated. The mosaic that is Canada, who we are as a nation, I think we have a little video for you. It's a beer commercial, but... Uh, <laughs> And I think you can tell a nation's soul by its beer commercials. And why don't you just run at uh, Gerald and it'll speak for itself. So there we are. Yeah, je suis Canadienne. Uh, ich bin Canadierin. The, um, now, historically, Canadians um, have drawn the immigrant communities from Europe. A lot of Brits, of course, French, German, Swedish, Iceland. You, you can track the immigration waves by whatever was happening in Europe, frankly. We had, uh, in the 1850s, there was a major volcanic eruption in Iceland that killed about half of the country's sheep and there was starvation. We have an Icelandic population that settled mostly in Manitoba. The Ukrainian famine brought a wave of Ukrainians. The Irish potato famine, waves of Irish. Um, World War I, displaced people from, uh, from the former Yugoslavia. World War II, Germans coming out, uh, coming after, you know, when East Germany was rebuilding, lots of immigration from Germany, Central Europe as well, Poland, everywhere. Hungary, we had two waves. We had one wave after 1945 and a second after 1956, after the Hungarian Revolution. You can track the, the patterns of the population. We had a wave of Americans coming to us during the Vietnam War. Who knew? Um, so this is what we call our draft dodgers. Um, when Americans don't know where to go, they come to Canada. They're just, <laughs> I'm just leaving that there. I'm just leaving that there. Um, these days, uh, our major immigration populations come from India, China, and the Philippines. So those languages are moving, moving up the scale. Now, over the past years, we've welcomed about 250,000 immigrants a year. 250,000, which represents almost 1% of our entire population coming in every year. And that's a concerted decision made by the government uh, a long time ago. And um, it is essentially looking at our demographics and how, uh, how do we sustain ourselves as a population. And uh, like many Western countries, uh, Canada does not have a very high birth rate. So we're sustaining our population by bringing them in from, from the outside. And uh, of course, um, what we then do, we have the luxury of choosing the immigrants who are the most likely to integrate into Canada. And, and that's a luxury that takes us back to uh, the original uh, 
point that I made about our geography, the blessing of geography, is we can pick who we bring in. We don't get um, populations landing on our shores, as, uh, as our Greek friends uh, have, for example. So we have a conscious policy of choosing immigrants that stand best uh, to integrate. We're doing this through a point system. And this is something that uh, is uh, still marveled at when I speak to Europe European colleagues, the, the idea that you actually have an active immigration program that allows people to come in legally as opposed to having to take the, the route of illicit migration. Uh, our, our point system awards points on knowledge of um, of uh, one of Canada's official languages, your profession, do you already have family in the country that can help you integrate, uh, or do you bring money as an entrepreneur, will you provide employment to Canada, all of these things give you points, and if you, if you make the points threshold, then, uh, then you, and it usually takes about a year or two, you can, um, you can become an immigrant to Canada, one of the 250,000. We also uh, take in about 85,000 refugees a year, around between 80, 85,000. The number, number depends. And um, so the total figure comes to usually around 330,000 new Canadians a year. And about 87% of them will take on Canadian citizenship once the various, uh, once the um, legislated waiting period is over. Um, our new government has committed to increase these numbers. So current immigration targets for the end of 2016 are going to be between 280,000 to 305,000. And that's on top of the refugees that we're taking. So that's, it's quite a number. Of those, about half or 53% are economic immigrants, people looking for a better life. 26% are family reunification immigrants. Somebody's already here wanting to bring in their, their mother, their child, their, their sibling. And uh, then 19% uh, of our overall immigrants are, are refugees. And there's also one or two percent uh, tiny little figure we call for humanitarian reasons. And those are usually people who have come here possibly illegally, who we might otherwise kick out of the country because they have not followed our immigration rules. But, but there are reasons for why they should stay. You know, either that be, they might be persecuted when they come back, so they, they become ref refugee surplus. They might be exposed to torture when they return or they founded a family while they were in Canada. Sometimes our processes, being a government, take very long. And uh, sometimes it takes five or six years for somebody to be rejected as a refugee, for example. Well, in those five or six years, they've integrated into Canada. And uh, then we might find humanitarian and compassionate grounds to, to keep them here. Um, it's, it's an, immigration is an engine for economic growth for Canada. We, we bring in... Um, the, uh, the cream of the crop, I should say. We have that luxury, and it's wonderful. Um, with the technological um, revolution, we've brought in a lot of um, folks from India. India has some fabulous experts in software engineering, software design. So for a while, we had a very large influx from India with that area of specialization. So we pick what our economy needs. And again, we're going back to the point system. The point system changes every year. So the, uh, the basic approach is we look at immigration as a good for the country, not as an evil. And I think that's a very important, uh, important point to make. Um, and uh, Canadians like that. Uh, of course, it helps that 20% of us are immigrants ourselves. But uh, there's a general acknowledgement in Canada that immigration is a very, very good thing. Now, um, where do the immigrants go? And I mentioned geography. The vast majority settle in the cities. Toronto is our largest city. I think greater Toronto area now has about 6 million people. Uh, that's about... Uh, well, it's about a sixth of, of Canada's entire population lives in the greater Toronto area, and it is the most diverse city on earth. Uh, the entire population has, uh, I don't know how many, uh, how many different mixes, but uh, when, when I said 20% of Canadians were not born in Canada, in Toronto it's 50%. Toronto is a city of immigrants. Uh, they will bring, of course, diverse religious, cultural traditions, and that 
brings with the challenges of inclusivity and cultural heritage, and how 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 do you deal with the um, with the with the influx of of different cultural traditions? In uh, through our multicultural culturalism policy, uh, which was uh, I mentioned earlier, started in 1971, we became the first country that approached multiculturalism as a core element of government policy, and I think that is extremely important. Um, we have the legislative foundation for diversity that I mentioned in our Charter of Rights, um, supported by additional legislation. I'm not going to bore you with the list. It's up there on the screen. But I think the important element is the policy of multiculturalism, where um, we essentially, um, instead of focusing on assimilation, making everybody the same, we're focusing on integration, uh, resulting in a mosaic. And... Um, we uh, we did this essentially well, full citizenship rights, of course, equal participation, but uh, integration of our language policies, as I mentioned, and uh, but also on a very local and community level, the celebration of diversity. We have uh, the most amazing festivals in Canada, Caribana in Ottawa. Have you done Caribana, Gel? It's it's fabulous. It's where our, our Caribbean communities celebrate themselves, and it's a it's a huge party, and it envelops the entire city. We have um, we have Chinese New Year. Um, my daughter, when she came back from grade two, surprised me during Chinese New Year, saying "Gong Hai Fat Choi." I said, "What's that? Well, that's Happy Chinese New Year in Chinese, and it's being taught in the schools now." It's, Chinese New Year is something we celebrate. We have we have stamps about it. It's it's been becoming part of the Canadian cultural fabric. So um, celebrating the diversity, I think, instead of trying to um, make everybody turn turn Canada into a melting pot, I think is absolutely important. But we're also working on um, on such things as shared citizenship, civic participation, cross cultural understanding institutions that reflect our diversity, right up into our cabinet, our, our new government, uh, you may have read about in the papers, um, when it took office in November, the cabinet was formed as literally a cross-section of Canadian society. We had Aboriginal members, we have four Canadians of, uh, of uh, Sikh origin, we've had two, uh, two Aboriginals, 50% women, 50% men, um, we had, had a disabled who's a um, disabled minister heading, heading Veterans Affairs. It's, uh, it's a cross-section of Canadian society, and, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's important for us, that in government institutions as well, Canadians see themselves reflected in, in, in all the diversity. And uh, again, it's a matter of, of government policy. Of course, challenges persist. Um, there is a, uh, still a minority, but it's a sizable minority, that, uh, that thinks ethnic diversity may weaken national culture. And uh, a whopping 45% feel that immigrants should give up their customs and traditions. Now, this is a, a little bit of the whiff of populism that you have here as well, the suggestion that uh, some of those customs are better than others. Some we're willing to celebrate. We love, we love um, Chinese food, for example. We love Lebanese food, but we don't like certain aspects of Sharia law. Yeah. So there is an element of Islamophobia that has raised uh, that has raised its uh, its hand uh, its head, and uh, that is something, however, that the government is taking active steps uh, to uh, to work on as well. Um, we have racism, we have hate crimes. We have uh, last year I asked Gerald to look it up. Um, our police investigated uh, 1,100 crimes that they consider to have been motivated by hate. And of those, 600 were race-related, mostly against black Canadians, African Canadians. 300 were religious-related, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and about 200 um, were, um, were other forms, mostly sexual orientation. So there's still, there's still work, to be do, work to be done. We are not, we're absolutely not perfect. But um, one thing that has given us considerable heart was after the Paris attacks uh, last year, for example, we had some attacks on mosques, um, vandalisms, um, things scrawled 
you know, written on, on, on the mosques. And each time we had such an incident, the rest of the population would come out and clean it up. And uh, so I, I think Canadians do like to identify themselves as a tolerant society, and, uh, and that's a very, very welcome. The, um, I think uh, we have discussions about racial profiling, as does everyone. I don't get frisked when I go through, well, I do get frisked when I go through airports because of my artificial knee and my hip, and uh, set off all the alarms. But uh, I didn't used to be because middle-aged females don't meet the profile. A colleague of mine who is uh, who's Arab Canadian, also a Canadian diplomat traveling on a diplomatic passport, but he gets searched all the time. And um, so we still have the racial profiling issue. We have police relations issues. We're addressing those uh, through policies um, that uh, emphasize community policing, meaning that the beat cops on the ground reflect the cultural, uh, the, the, the ethnic makeup of the community that they are policing. So um, that brings us to the refugees and, uh, and to uh, incorporating 25,000 new Canadians into Canada. When, um, when, during our election campaign last summer, we had one party campaigning a little bit on a platform, it wasn't exactly Islamophobic, but drew on the differences between um, Muslims and what they called, well, I don't know if they call it ordinary Canadians, old stock Canadians, I think was the phrase, old stock Canadians, whatever that means. And, um, and it was countered by our now government with a campaign that says, no, a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian, we're all the same. And uh, instead of harboring fear of um, particularly Syrian refugees, Islamic refugees, by suggesting that they're all going to be terrorists, we're going to be bringing in 25,000 of them because it's a situation we need to address and that's who Canada is. And Canadians responded, we have a new government. And uh, they started immediately with, uh, with the policy to, to bring in, they wanted to do it, they took office on November 4th and they wanted to have 25,000 Syrian refugees in Canada by, by December 31st. Well, that ran up against logistical problems. You just simply couldn't interview that many and transport them. So they extended it to the 20, uh, February 29th. Now, uh, and by t February 29th, we did have over 25,000 in the country. Now, refugees are categorized in three different groups in Canada. The first are government-assisted refugees. Now, those tend to be referred to by resettle for resettlement by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And resettlement in Canada for, these, uh, for that category is entirely supported by the government of Pan Canada. In the case of these Syrian refugees, government paid for the, paid for the flight, pay, it pays for uh, housing for a while, it pays for uh, a language training and, and assists with integration. Um, privately sponsored refugees, now that's the one category that attracts the most interest these days globally and also here in the Netherlands. This is a category we've had since the 1970s in Canada. It's only really now getting a lot of attention, where individuals or groups provide financial and other support for refugees for the duration of the sponsorship, which is usually one year. And there's a minimum threshold, and it's, uh, it's $25,000. So we have groups of Canadians that come together, and these are colleagues in the work environment, we have schools, churches, NGOs, uh, wealthy individuals, put up the money and bring in a refugee family. And um, what they then do is they don't just pay the money and, and drop them, but they also look after them. They, they take them to the language classes, they show the kids the school, they take them to bring them to family dinners and make them feel welcome. And uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous program. Uh, it was written up, and, and you can Google this if you want. There's a wonderful article in the New York Times about six or eight weeks ago on the uh, Canadian um, private sponsorship program. Just Google New York Times, Canadian private sponsorship, Syrian refugees, and it'll pop up. It's a, it's a very, very good article that shows you how it actually works in, in practice. Um, 
then uh, the third category is a blended uh, blended category, which uh, is uh, refer uh, where referred refugees re uh, refugees referred by UNHCR are matched with private sponsors. Usually, the sponsors can can pick their can, can pick their refugees. Or some some are referred. Um, the uh, provincial governments in Canada have been extremely supportive of the Syrian refugee initiative and each province uh, communicated with the federal government how many they could take. And that's actually quite similar to what's happening here in Holland, in the Netherlands, where municipalities have indicated, yes, we can take that many and, and worked on, uh, on integration as well. And, and we heard the example of Red Belt University itself taking really a prominent role uh, in, that, in that effort. But uh, the important thing, I think, to our approach is the high level of engagement from private Canadians. Um, it's, uh, I think originally the figure was supposed to be 25,000. I think we've been up to 30,000 now. And a lot of that is the result of, um, of private sponsorship. And frank there's, there's greater demand than there is supply, <laughs> frankly. So uh, there are still sponsorship groups waiting for their families. And uh, in terms of the, uh, the arrivals, the government organized 99 flights, from mostly from Lebanon, Jordan, and uh, I think it was Lebanon and Jordan where we got most of our refugees from, some from Turkey, um, 99 flights to Toronto and Montreal. Now, of course, there are challenges with that. Um, a lot of the refugees we've brought in have low levels of education and virtually no knowledge of English and French. Um, particularly the ones that are government assisted, the ones that were referred to us as high risk by UNHCR. A lot of young children, so and finding affordable accommodation for large families can be difficult in large cities. There are health issues, a lot of psychological trauma uh, coming out uh, coming from uh, a war zone. Of course, it leaves its mark. Many many of our refugees have PTSD. Um, other mental health issues, they need dental care. Some of them have never seen a dentist in their lives. So, so there's, there are a lot of financial challenges as well. And uh, our private sponsors are stepping up remarkably to that. Um, and, and there are some concerns that the government-assisted refugees may not have that same personalized support. But, uh, but again, we're, we're working on that. So I think the, the conclusion that I would have to all of that is um, that Canada is a country that is formed out of so many different populations that diversity and difference and, and respect for the diversity, we don't call it tolerance, we call it respect for diversity, is, is in our national DNA, it's, it's who we are. And I think that has very much colored our response to, uh, to the Syria crisis. Again, um, I, I won't deny that we have the benefit of, uh, of geography. We can bring refugees in rather than have them flood our shores. So we are in a different situation and how we handle things may not necessarily be um, appropriate or equal to how the situation needs to be handled in, uh, in, in certain countries in Europe, for example. But, uh, but I think there are some, ex some, uh, some lessons to be learned from our experience. And the big one is uh, you ha if you want to have immigration, or if you know if, whether you want it or not, if immigration or migration is a fact of your national life, you need to have in place a solid integration policy and a solid policy approaching multiculturalism and, and respect for diversity. If you don't have those things, you will see negative effects, I think, in, in the long run. Um, I think the final thought that I'd leave you with is, um, is when I mentioned this at dinner, um, nationalists or populists sometimes say, well, we just want to live in harmony. We just you know, want to be ourselves. Well, harmony isn't everybody singing the same song. Harmony is different voices singing different songs coming up with a whole that is better than the sum of its parts. That is harmony and that is diversity. And uh, with that, I'd be very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Thank you very much for your very interesting and informative lecture. I think there were lots of facts and figures, mm -hmm. um, but there was also a clear argument. 
And mm -hmm. I think that's what makes your lecture interesting and also more than just um, a talk by an ambassador about the country where you're coming from, um, but something of, of common interest to all of us. And um, one interesting thing that I noted in the preparation that we had of our talk was when I asked you how you would like me to address you, you said, well, you can call me Sabine, you can call me Miss Nolke, uh, but don't call me Your Excellency. Um, I think this says something also about similarities between Dutch culture and Canadian culture, uh, the kind of informality that we have, and I hope that this evening will also have a bit of that informality and that people will be posing the questions that they want to pose to you and get the answers, the frank answers that you want to give them. Um, the, the more open-minded and, and informal we get, the better it will be, I think. Of course, bearing in mind that you're still representing your, um, your country to the Netherlands. I'd be as frank as I can be. That's what I meant, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I think in this room we're all very much concerned about the so-called refugee crisis. Yeah. And um, uh, you made comparisons between Canada and Europe, Canada and the Netherlands, um, when it comes to refugees. Your presentation was very sympathetic, I think, and engaging. Um, but I'm playing a bit the, the, the devil's attorney here. What about two major differences? You pointed out one of them, which is that the places where refugees come from do not border on Canada. It's not uh, thousands of Mexicans wanting to cross the Niagara Falls. Um, you can, as you pointed out, you can select them, you can, um, um, and you can pick, pick the immigrants, the refugee immigrants that you want to have. Western Europe, of course, Europe in general, is in a different situation and, uh, when it comes to that. Yeah, Syria is our I, backyard. Yeah, sure. Yeah, can please. I just interrupt? We don't pick, though, based on ethnic origin or no, no. cultural or yeah. racial differences. We, we pick on what's of interest to Canada in terms of our economic and, and social interests yes. in our long-term long -term, uh, population policy. But still you pick. Yes, we pick. <laughs> Um, and, and Syria and, and Lebanon are our backyard in a way in which uh, they are not your backyard. You pointed that out. But sec there's a second point, I think, which, despite the fact that so many Canadians live in this oval that you pointed out, um, Canada has an average population density of four people on a square kilometer, even a little bit less, I think. The Netherlands have over 400. So we have a factor of 100 more people in this country. And... In spite of urbanization, I think that that means to a certain extent that ref Im immigration by refugees is, a way, is in a way a luxury problem for Canada in a way that it is, cannot be for the Netherlands. And that explains perhaps also part of public reactions to the, um, the influx of, of um, immigrants. So to which extent exactly do you think it is fair to compare the two situations? Um, on the one hand, I think you make a number of valuable remarks and I would even invite you to, to give us perhaps a few do's and don'ts when it comes to integration of, of refugees. But can you really compare the two situations? Uh, yeah, I, I think you can. I think you can. I mean, there, there are differences of geographical context, of course. And, uh, and yes, we, we bring our, our people in. They don't come to us. And that's, that, that is the difference. Both Canada and the Netherlands are very wealthy countries. Mm -hmm. We have um, the economic security. We have our co economic um, opportunities. And uh, the only thing I think that differs um, really is that Canada is historically a country of immigrants. Mm -hmm. Immigrant, immigration is, is part of the fabric of our society, where it is not in the Netherlands. And uh, that is a response that I get frequently when I talk to colleagues here in the Netherlands. is that, yeah, you're different, you're, you're a country of immigrants, we're not. Well, historically, actually, you are. Um, but uh, it, takes, uh, it takes an attitudinal shift to, to appreciate that. And then once you accept that, yes, we are a destination country mm. for migration, you've had French coming in, I think, during the Huguenot War, and you've had historical waves of populations moving in from Germany, from, from other countries in Europe. So you are actually uh, now, uh, Indonesians 
following uh, colonization, of course, you are a nation of immigrants. You just haven't quite addressed that. And uh, in, in, some, in some, of the, some of the policies. And I think that's, that's where I think you could look to Canada as an example, by all the differences, mm -hmm. because the, the basic situation is the same, a population with an influx of other people coming elsewhere. How do you deal with that? You have to, first of all, accept it as a historical fact and then look at integration as a necessary response. Um, I, I'm not trying to tell, certainly, uh, the Dutch government how it should, uh, how it should handle the situation, but it's, a, it's something that I've seen throughout Europe, is integration is something people don't really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should, because fundamentally you are the same. You are a country with originally a homogeneous ethnic population, unlike us, we already started out with different ethnicities, but influx from the outside, that those situations are the same. How the people get there is, is a bit of a red herring, frankly. Mm -hmm. well, I would still think that in the situation of the Netherlands, the, the cases that you mentioned, and there are, there are many examples of influx of people from, uh, mm -hmm. from elsewhere, but we, the most, most of these examples, I think, are cases of an, some kind of international crisis or mm -hmm. a crisis, some, you mentioned the Huguenots. I mean, mm -hmm. they fled uh, mm -hmm. religious persecution. And I think we, as an, as a, we in the Netherlands, we tend to think of ourselves as a tolerant and welcoming mm -hmm. country for people who are in a crisis situation, mm -hmm. but not as a country that welcomes immigrants because of economic growth or because mm -hmm. of the development of the country. Could that be yeah. a major difference between the two? And maybe, I don't know if you want to yeah. respond directly to this. Well, um, it could be, frankly. Uh, your birth rate is about the same as ours. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're looking at the long-term demographics of the country, immigration is a solution to stability. I, I had a long discussion with one of, uh, one of my staff members, who's, who's Dutch, just the other day, about mm -hmm. how the retirement age has mm -hmm. increased to 67 because the population base isn't there to sustain <coughs> earlier retirement anymore. You have you have an getting to have an inverse pyramid. Well, immigration can straighten that out for yeah. you, and that's how we're looking at it in uh, in Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, we're so sustaining our population through immigration. So, is it a mat matter of switching our minds? I think developing so. a different mindset yeah. about this. I, I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah, as a, as a, as a policy, it, it's not. Um, I mean, mindset. It's you. You're very right. The Netherlands is a very tolerant society, and I think Canada and the Netherlands are so closely linked and such close allies and friends in the international scene because we are so like-minded on that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of government policy, there's, there's one step that hasn't yet been taken. Mm -hmm. Is this something, this is also maybe about your position as an ambassador, is this something that you can tell the Dutch government? Are you in dialogue about these issues? I mean, not telling in the, in the sense of teaching them what to yeah. do, but is this a point of discussion? Or I'm very happy to respond to questions on this when asked. And I'm very happy to, um, <laughs> and I'm very happy to come out and give lectures like this. This is a prime example of a diplomatic answer, I would say. <laughs> At this moment, I'd like to move on to um, one of the topics that you mentioned, multiculturalism. Um, multiculturalism, multicultural society, has been a big issue in the Netherlands as well. Um, I think Canada and the Netherlands, and also Sweden, for example, were among the champions of multiculturalism. And Canada is particularly important when, at this university, when we teach about multiculturalism, we use Charles Taylor, we use, we use Will Kimlitska, um, so we use Canadian authors when it comes to multiculturalism. In the Netherlands, multicultural society at some point, I think it was during the 1990s, had been, has been declared dead. It has been declared a failed strategy, a failed idea, a mistaken idea, and there was a switch, at least at the level of public discourse, towards Dutch national identity and things like that. Um, which at this point in time is also being reaffirmed in education, for example, you know, in history teaching and things like that. People want to emphasize Dutch history, Dutch identity and things like that. Um, now, so when maybe at some point the Netherlands and Canada were leading in this respect and they had a global agenda about multicultural society, 
um, today Canada seems to be alone in this respect. And um, I think many people in this audience will be sympathetic to what you pointed out about the current Canadian, uh, Canadian government. My question is, to which extent is this something that the Canadian government is saying about Canada? This is the way we do it. We think it's a good idea. Follow our example if you like, but don't follow it if you don't like it. Or is it um, a message to the world? Is there something um, missionary about it? No, I, Do you I, think it's a good idea for any society, to put it a bit I think more pointedly? so, yes. Diversity is strength, frankly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, any, any problem is more easily solved if you look at it from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. If you only ever look at um, any kind of problem, whether it's social, economic, or political security problem, if you only look at it through one lens, you will only see that bit. Um, if you look at it from different angles, whether it's um, because of cognitive diversity or because you come from a different cultural background, you see different things. And I think it allows a more holistic approach mm -hmm. to, uh, to problem solving if you bring different perspectives to it. And, uh, and again, just, just one, one little example. I think it, it is part of, an, of our national identity, uh, this valuing of different perspectives. Um, when... When, I, um, when we as public servants go through a promotion process, one of the, one of the qualities and one of the uh, categories we evaluate it on is um, whether or not we can appreciate cultural differences and value different perspectives. It's actually a category of evaluation for, for a job like mine. Am I prepared to accept different perspectives? If not, well, then I, I don't think I could be doing this job, frankly, uh, especially not as a diplomat who also works mm -hmm. in a multilateral environment. I have to be able to see things like a Russian, like a Nigerian, like, like a Mexican, in order to be able to negotiate effectively. So, uh, so to answer your question, yes, I think we, we think it is important to, uh, to respect diversity, we, we think it's important to hear different voices. Are we missionary about it? We're Canadian, we don't proselytize. Mm -hmm. We just put things on the table and say, here, help yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but we do put it on the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and the table, in principle, is the rest of the world. That's right, yeah. that's right. Okay. And, and that's why I was saying, when I, when I started out, I find it very um, personally rewarding to see in the media now the, um, I, I don't want to call it admiration, but the recognition mm -hmm. that, that there is a different way of looking at things mm -hmm. and that maybe the Canadians are onto something because the negativity and the fear and the scaremongering really aren't working for anyone. Does this apply across the board? I mean, does it apply? I can easily think of many cases in which this is a very sensible point of view, like seeing mm -hmm. things from different perspectives, seeing things from different traditions, etc. But does it apply across the board? Does it apply, for example, um, to sexual orientations? Is it, an, mm -hmm. uh, is it an important asset if you also look at sexual orientations from the perspective of Sharia law or at same-sex marriage or something like that? I mean, would you, at which, to which extent is that a matter of taking into the discussion different perspectives? Or where does it become a clash between yeah. different ways of now, seeing things now you and get, different cultures? Now you're getting into values, I think, rather than perspectives. Okay. And there, there is a fundamental baseline of values. And our fundamental baseline is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was co-drafted by a Canadian. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It's in, embedded in our charter. So uh, those are the fundamental values. We, as, as a country in multi, uh, multilateral environments such as the Human Rights Council, we speak out against what we call cultural relativism, mm -hmm. where you say it's okay to, to um, yeah. discriminate against women because we follow a certain belief. No, equality of women is the, is the, is the baseline value. So yes, there, there, are, um, there are things where we draw the line and where we don't see the perspective as being a valid one. Mm -hmm. and, and what does and drawing the line mean in that case? The, how, does the, how does the Canadian government speak to those members of uh, immigrant communities who say, well, we don't accept 
equality of sexual orientation, or we don't accept the quality of women? Well, one of the things when, when we did our selection of the refugees that came, that were brought into Canada, we, we did speak to them about mm -hmm. fundamental values in Canadian society and, and respect for diversity, respect for equality between men and women, uh, respect for uh, uh, equality of sexual orientation. All of those things were put on the table. Mm -hmm. And essentially, if you come to Canada, those are the values by which you are expected to live. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do things like uh, we, we prosecute um, certain practice honor killings, for example. Mm -hmm. Don't tolerate that. We, we don't tolerate uh, any kind of discrimination, gender discrimination, etc., etc. And uh, that's why when I mentioned hate crimes, mm -hmm. you know, some of those things are characterized as hate crimes in, or, or hate, motivated, hate motivated crimes in Canadian law. And that's, that's where we draw the line. And does that also involve that people who come into Canada, refugees for example, have to declare that they subscribe to the idea of diversity or that they do accept the catalogue of human rights or do you have to sign something? <laughs> no, <laughs> not that I know of, I don't think so, no, no, no we don't. Mm -hmm. But we tell them these are the Canadian values and that this is what we would expect of you. Yeah. And quite frankly, the vast majority of them are absolutely fine with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. At this point, it's exactly nine o'clock. Uh, at this point, I would like to thank you very much for both your lecture and the uh, answers that you gave uh, to questions from the audience and the discussion that we had. I think you, you gave a brilliant example of a Canadian diplomat in the Netherlands. Thank you. Um, and, um, and an immigrant. And an immigrant in Canada. And uh, I think that that's, um, not, it has not only been very informative, but also, at least from my perspective, also inspiring to, uh, to hear you. you tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.